What do we do after a person dies? Throughout human history and in places around the world, people have done many different things with their dead. The ancient Egyptians, for instance, took great care when preparing the bodies of their dead rulers. It was believed that their leaders were immortal and would need their bodies in another world after death, the afterworld. In a process that took several months, ancient Egyptians carefully preserved dead bodies through a process called embalming. They wrapped the bodies with layers of linen, wax, and spices. Some of these mummies still exist today, some 6,000 years later. In the United States today, most people are buried in coffins. Funeral ceremonies take place so that people can honor the deceased and give comfort and support to his or her family and friends. Music, prayers, and eulogies speeches remembering and praising the dead person are often a part of these ceremonies. A funeral usually ends when the deceased is taken to a cemetery. A place where bodies are buried in the ground. A headstone or marker listing the person's name, birth, and death date. And other information is left at the burial spot. Which family members and friends may later visit and decorate with flowers in memory of their loved one. How big will I become? Several different factors determine how big a person will grow. The most important one is heredity, the passing of physical traits from parents to children. When you began as a single fertilized cell, your mother and father each contributed. Half the genes coded chemical information needed for you to live and grow. These genes are responsible for your physical traits, like the color of your eyes and hair. How your body will be shaped, and how tall you will become. That is why children look a lot like their parents, or even their grandparents. They have inherited family characteristics that may have been passed on for several generations. If your parents are big or tall, chances are good that you will be big or tall, too. The average height of a woman in the United States is about 5 feet, 4 inches. 1.6 meters, and the average height for an American man is 5 feet, 9 inches, 1.75 meters. In spite of genetic coding, certain conditions can keep people from growing as large as their genes say they should. Bad nutrition keeps a body from reaching its maximum size. Poor health and disease do the same. That is why people who lived in generations before us, when food was sometimes scarce and health care was poor, were quite a bit smaller than we are today. Taking good care of your body, then, helps it become the best it can be. Why does head hair grow longer than other hair on the body?
LL hairs have a particular lifespan before they fall out. With a lifespan of about 2 to 5 years, head hair grows longer than other hair on your body. Eyebrow hairs, on the other hand, have a lifespan of just 3 to 5 months. If you stopped cutting the hair on your head, you could get it to grow to about your waist before hairs would start to fall out, and new hairs began to grow to replace them. A few people, however, can grow their hair much longer than that. A woman in India holds the record for the longest hair, 13 feet, 10.5 inches. Where do insects go in the winter? Most insects survive the winter in an inactive state known as diapause. It is a type of hibernation. In which all body processes slow down and little energy is required for survival. A few types of insects, like the monarch butterfly of North America, migrate to a warmer place just like many birds to spend the winter, returning in the spring. What plant has the biggest flower? The largest flower in the world has a rather unpleasant name and an equally unpleasant scent. The stinking corpse lily, or Rafflesia arnoldi. This rare and endangered flower grows in the jungles of the Southeast Asian islands Borneo and Sumatra. The flowers are orange brown in color with large white speckles. They can measure 3 feet across and weigh up to 25 pounds, 11 kilograms. Because the stinking corpse lily is a parasite plant which means that it gets its nourishment from other plants it has no stem or leaves. The flower seeds attach themselves to jungle vines and burrow into the vine's tissue. Where they germinate and grow. Eventually a blossom pushes through the vine and grows to huge proportions. Can a turtle climb out of its shell? A turtle can no more climb out of its shell than a person can remove his or her backbone. The turtle's shell is fused, or attached, to its backbone, ribs, and parts of its shoulder and hip bones. If an empty turtle shell is found, it means that turtle has died, and its shell is all that remains. How can an owl see at night? Most owls are nocturnal hunters, meaning they are active at night rather than during the day. Their large eyes have special features that allow them to see well even on very dark nights. An owl's retina the part of the eye that controls sensitivity to light is equipped with a certain kind of cell that gives the owl excellent vision even when there is very little light. While many animals can move their eyes without moving their heads, owls' eyes are practically immovable. They make up for this limitation by having extremely flexible necks.
Owls can turn their necks more than 180 degrees, meaning they can look directly behind them. There is a popular misconception that owls are blinded by bright light. In fact, their pupils can act just like people's pupils do. Reducing to a very small size in bright light in order to protect the retina. Not only can owls see in bright daylight, but they actually have better vision in that kind of light than do people. How do boats float? The weight of an object pulls it down into water. It displaces or pushes water aside. But if the object's density, its weight in relation to its size, is less than the density of the water it displaces, it will float. That principle explains why a heavy wooden raft can float in water, while a small stone will sink to the bottom. One spreads its weight over a large area, while the other's weight is concentrated. Boats, which are hollow, float because of this principle. The air inside them makes them less dense than they appear. Large ships that transport heavy material, though, have less air inside when they are carrying a big load. Such ships must be careful about weight limits and have load lines on their hulls that show how low they can ride in the water and still maneuver safely. Weight limits vary with the kind of water the boats are traveling through, they can carry more weight when in salt water seas which are denser than fresh water, and in cold water, which is denser than warm water. Boats need a power source to move them forward in the water. In small vessels this power can be provided by people, who use oars to paddle along. Muscle power can't move boats very fast or very far, though. The wind can be used too, as long as it's blowing, to move boats equipped with sails. But for a large boat that needs to go a long distance, the most reliable source of power is a motor-driven engine. Depending on the size of the boat, a gasoline engine, diesel engine, or steam engine can do the job. Nuclear power is even used to run some boat engines, like those found in submarines. Motors rotate boat propellers, which have large twisting blades that radiate around a central hub. These blades push water backwards, and the boat moves forward as the disturbed water pushes back. Rotating propellers also create lower water pressure in the space in front of them which sucks them forward, along with the vessel to which they are attached. Using these same principles of movement, propellers can also power aircraft. A boat is steered by a rudder, which is a flat, upright, movable piece of wood or metal that is attached to its stern, or rear. When turned, the rudder changes the direction of the water around it which pushes back forcing the stern. And gradually the rest of the boat, to change direction, too. Because boats must push aside the weight of the water through which their hulls are moving. They do not travel very fast. Water that is pushed one way always pushes back, causing resistance. Boats that are meant to go fast, like speedboats, 
are designed to ride as high in the water as possible, to minimize water drag. Their hulls are shaped to rise out of the water when they are running at top speeds. What do the letters on M and M candies stand for? During the 1940s, when M and M candies were first introduced, two men headed the company that made them. Mr. Mars and Mr. Murray ran the M and M candies company, which has since become Mars Incorporated. And they put the initials of their last names on the colorful treats. The letters used to be printed on the candies in black, but since 1954 the MS have been white. What are predators and prey? A seal swims through cold ocean waters in search of a meal. He spots a nearby fish, swims to it, and eats it. In that situation, the seal is the predator, an animal that hunts down and eats another animal for food. The fish, on the other hand, is the prey, an animal that is hunted as a food source by another animal. In the ever-shifting world of the animal kingdom, however, an animal that is a predator in one situation could be the prey in another. The fish-eating seal, for example, might later find itself the intended prey of a hunting polar bear. While it may seem harsh and cruel, and it's always difficult to watch on television nature shows. Animals hunting one another is a natural and necessary process. Animals don't hunt other animals for sport they do so because they need to eat in order to survive. All living things depend on each other for survival many animals, herbivores, need to eat plants, other animals, carnivores, need to eat those plant-eating animals. And some animals, called omnivores, eat both plants and meat. The waste produced by animals, as well as the nutrients that result when an animal's body decomposes or breaks down, after death, enriches the soil, providing necessary ingredients for plants to thrive. An animal that primarily eats the leaves of a certain tree, or that requires that tree to make its home, would have trouble surviving if all of those trees were destroyed. And if that animal cannot survive, its predators cannot survive and such struggles for survival echo all the way up the food chain. What is a star? Just like our sun, Stars are spheres of gases that give off tremendous energy, light, and heat. While the gases that make them may vary. It is always hydrogen that is responsible for the nuclear reactions that power them. Stars also vary in size and brightness. The largest stars, known as supergiants, are hundreds of times greater in size than our Sun. Other stars known as white dwarfs can be as small as Earth. The color of a star is related to its size and surface temperature, and can range from red to orange to yellow to white to blue. 
red stars have surface temperatures of about 5,400 degrees Fahrenheit, 3,000 degrees Celsius. While blue stars have surface temperatures of 18,000 to 90,000 degrees Fahrenheit, 10,000 to 50,000 degrees Celsius. The term scientists use to describe the brightness of stars is magnitude. A star's magnitude can be difficult to determine just by looking at it. A bright star, if it is very far from Earth, may look dim to us simply because its light has so far to travel. A dim star, on the other hand, would appear quite bright if it is very close to our planet. In terms of stars' actual brightness, as opposed to how bright they appear to our eyes. The brightest stars are also the hottest ones blue stars. Our yellow sun is a star of medium size and magnitude. Who decides what is right and wrong? When you are young, it is mainly your parents. But also teachers and other grown UPS close to you, who decide what is right and wrong. They are the ones who make the rules that they believe will keep you safe. And help you learn how to become a good person and get along in the world. Adults make the best teachers because they have experienced a lot of different situations while growing up themselves. And they have learned lessons from those experiences that they can share with you. Grown UPS are wiser than children, who have lived just a short time in the world. But, as you continue to mature, you will have your own experiences and learn your own lessons. You may begin to question certain rules, and your ideas about what is right and wrong may change. This development is a normal part of growing up. The point at which you start to become the independent and unique person you are meant to be. Still, no matter how much you change. It is important to remember that some rules of behavior will always remain the same. One rule is to treat yourself with care and respect. Another is to treat others with the same thoughtfulness. And respect with which you would like them to treat you. When you grow up, you will have to follow the rules of law and government in the country in which you live. Many of these rules are based on respect for the rights of others. How do air traffic controllers know where planes are in the sky? Air traffic controllers use radar invisible bands of energy called radio waves, which are similar to visible light waves, to detect where airplanes are located in the air. They are the same type of waves as those used in broadcasting but with higher frequencies. Radar waves, which travel in a straight line and at a constant speed are sent out in all directions through antennae. When radar waves meet distant objects like planes, they are reflected back to receivers. Controllers can tell how far away the objects are located by the speed at which the reflected waves return. Radar receivers process the return signals electronically. Using them to visually plot planes on a screen that represents the sky. 
With radar, controllers can tell how high and fast a plane is flying and in what direction it is heading. While large commercial airplanes have their own radar devices on board to report their altitudes, distance from the ground, and to warn them of obstacles in their paths, smaller aircraft do not. Air traffic controllers keep all planes around an airport at a safe distance from one another, and they direct takeoffs and landings. Controllers can even help a plane land in heavy fog by watching its flight on their radar screen and radioing directions to the pilot. Because radar can detect the position, motion, and even the size and shape of very distant objects, it is used for many other purposes. These purposes include ship navigation. Storm detection and weather forecasting, map making, and space exploration. How is sonar different from radar? Sonar, short for sound navigation ranging and radar, radio detection and ranging. Work in much the same way to locate distant objects. In both cases invisible waves are sent out and reflected back once they hit something solid. The time it takes for the waves to return to their point of origin tells how far away an object is located. Radar uses a certain type of light wave known as a radio wave to locate objects. Like all light waves, radar travels in a straight line and at a constant speed. At 186,000 miles, 299,274 kilometers per second, which is the speed of light. Sonar uses sound waves to locate objects. These waves, too, travel in a straight line. But at varying speeds, depending on what they are traveling through. Sound is caused by the vibration of an object. Which in turn vibrates surrounding molecules that make sound waves in a kind of chain reaction. Sonar detection is mainly used underwater, where light waves do not travel well. In water, sound waves move about four times faster than they do through air because water is denser and has more molecules that can vibrate. But even at 4,600 feet, 1,400 meters per second, Sound waves travel much more slowly than light waves. They also can't be used in outer space, which is airless and has essentially no molecules at all. What should you do if all your efforts in school bring disappointing results? Don't be ashamed and don't give up. The most important thing is not how much you learn. Or how fast you learn, but that you continue to learn and do your best. Why do I sometimes get a headache when I eat ice cream? You may have heard people call it a brain freeze, or an ice cream headache. 
you're gulping down some ice cream or a slush on a hot summer day. And all of a sudden you have a pain in your head that feels like you ran into a wall for it first. Why do dogs bark? Dogs bark to communicate with other dogs and with humans. Dogs are descendants of wolves, which are social animals that live in packs. And they share many of the behaviors that define the complex relationships that exist within such animal groups. Few domestic dogs live together in packs, though they often consider their human family their group. But they still use complicated behaviors that involve smell, sight, and hearing to communicate. A dog has many scent producing glands that it uses to communicate. The scent that a dog leaves behind, in its urine, feces, and paw prints, can reveal its sex, age, and even its mood to other dogs that come sniffing by. A dog uses its posture, facial expression, and ear and tail position to communicate with other dogs, too. And it uses its voice to communicate by whining, growling, howling, or barking. A dog usually whines or whimpers when it is in distress, when it is hungry, cold, or in pain. Growls indicate that a dog is angry and ready to fight. Howls and barks usually show excitement. In the wild, wolves and other canines use howling and barking to call together the pack for a hunt. For feeding, or to warn against danger. When wolves were tamed, or domesticated, between 12,000 and 14,000 years ago. The less dangerous ones were kept to act as guard dogs, to help in hunting, or to herd other domesticated animals. Barking was a useful trait, a handy alarm system that let their Human masters know of approaching intruders, prey, or predators. This desirable trait was bred into new dogs. This means that the owners would arrange for two dogs who barked a lot to mate. Producing a litter of pups with a tendency to bark often. Then those pups would be bred with other pups who like to bark, and so on. Over time, domesticated dogs came to use their barks to communicate with their owners. Today, your pet dog barks when it's excited, needs attention, or wants something. It uses its bark to communicate much more than it would if it were living in the wild. How did we get the United States National Anthem? In September 1814, the United States and Great Britain were in the midst of fighting what is known as the War of 1812. The British had taken over Washington, D. C. and planned to attack Baltimore, Maryland. A few American citizens, including a lawyer and poet named Francis Scott Key, approached the British fleet, which was anchored in Chesapeake Bay, to request the release of an American who had been taken prisoner. The British agreed to let the prisoner and the others return to American shores. But their return had to wait until the British were done attacking Fort McHenry, which was defending Baltimore. 
throughout the night of September 13th to 14th, Ki heard the explosions of the battle. Anxiously awaiting morning to see whether the Americans had won the battle. In the early morning light, Ki could see that Fort McHenry's enormous American flag was still waving. Indicating that the Americans had been triumphant. Relieved and inspired by the sight, Key composed a poem called Defense of Fort M. Henry. Why do clothes for men and women have their buttons on different sides? Most people, about 90%, are right-handed, and it is easiest for them to button their clothes from left to right. Which is the way that men's buttons are arranged. Why do cats purr? It is generally believed that cats purr to show contentment, but no one knows for sure. Cats are born with the ability to purr, kittens make the tiny rumbling sounds when they are nursing. Scientists think that purring starts out as a form of communication between a mother cat and her kittens. The purrs let the mother cat know that her babies are happy and feeding well. And she may purr back in response. Later, cats continue to purr when they are in a contented mood or as a friendly greeting. But scientists aren't exactly sure how cats purr. Many think that it comes from the vibration of blood in a large vein in a cat's chest. Caused when surrounding muscles repeatedly squeeze and release the blood vessel. Air in a cat's lungs and windpipe increase the sound of the vibration so that it can be heard. Though sometimes the purring of a cat is silent and can only be felt. Other scientists think that cats purr when membranes called false vocal cords. Located in a cat's throat near the real ones, start to vibrate. Why can't I yell or hit when I'm mad? It certainly isn't wrong to feel mad about things that happen. You can't help but get mad when your brother breaks your favorite toy or when someone cuts in front of you when you're standing in line. Life is full of all sorts of things that we think are unfair or that upset us. But yelling and hitting is not the answer. When you yell or hit someone, it is likely that he or she will yell or hit back. Someone could get hurt, and the situation gets worse, not better. If everyone yelled and hit when they got mad, the world would be an awful place. Stop and count to ten when you get mad. That way you can get control of your feelings. Then you will be able to think more clearly. And thinking not just quickly reacting is what changes bad situations. Maybe your brother feels terrible about breaking your toy but can't say he's sorry because you're punching him. Instead, tell him how sad you feel and give him a chance to apologize. It was probably an accident after all, nobody's perfect. 
chances are you've broken something that belonged to someone else, too. And if you and your brother use your brains instead of your raised voices and fists. Maybe the two of you can think of a fair solution. Sometimes even when you talk reasonably to the person who has made you mad. He or she still doesn't respond in a nice way. It is hardest then to control your feelings. Do people die when struck by lightning? Most people struck by lightning do not die. If lightning, which is about the width of a pencil, does not pass through a person's heart, brain, or spinal cord, interrupting or damaging the electrical impulse cells that run them, then that person usually survives. While the electrical discharge of a lightning bolt is powerful and hot. Up to 54,000 degrees Fahrenheit, or 30,000 degrees Celsius, it is fortunately incredibly quick. Survivors often have burn marks on their skin and clothes. Especially where the lightning has entered and left their bodies. While it's possible to survive a lightning strike, it is best to follow safety precautions to avoid testing that possibility. When a thunderstorm approaches, go inside a building or closed car or truck. The vehicle's metal body will offer a safe path for lightning's electrical current to flow to the ground. The exterior of a building will do the same. One thing to remember when you are in a building, however, is to stay off a cord phone and avoid using plumbing fixtures or electrical appliances until the storm passes. Lightning can move through the ground for quite a distance from the place where it strikes. And it may on rare occasions travel along water, electrical, or phone lines into your home. If a thunderstorm approaches so quickly that you can't find shelter, you can still take steps to protect yourself outdoors. Remember that lightning always takes the shortest route to earth, so avoid being near tall things. You may feel tempted to stand under a tall tree for protection from the rain. But remember that a tree may be struck by lightning. Don't stand on a hilltop, instead, try to find the lowest ground you can like a ditch or a valley and crouch there. Trying to make yourself as small as possible. Avoid bodies of water, swimming pools, lakes, or even puddles. And metal objects both water and metal conduct electricity well. And if lightning struck them the electrical current would travel through to everything touching the water or metal. Can all birds fly? All birds have wings, but not all of them can fly. Scientists believe that all birds could, at some point in their evolution, fly, but that some have lost the ability over millions of years. Some of the best known examples of flightless birds are penguins and ostriches. And ostrich relatives like emus and kiwis. One of the primary benefits of flight is being able to escape enemies quickly. 
flightless birds must rely on other techniques to save themselves. Penguins have made up for their flightlessness by being outstanding swimmers. They use their wings as flippers. Ostriches can use their great size to scare away many predators. And if that doesn't work, they always have their legs. Ostriches can run at speeds of 40 miles, 65 kilometers, per hour. And if the attacker does manage to get close, the ostrich might just give a powerful kick. Scientists think that some birds lose the ability to fly, over the course of many generations. When they live in isolated regions where they don't have predators. The great auk, which is now extinct. Inhabited an island where flight was unnecessary because there were no mammal predators present. Therefore, from lack of use, the great auk's wings became useless over time. Other birds in the same family as the great auk that live in regions populated by predators have never lost the ability to fly. Why do burning things make smoke? During a fire, the air around it becomes heated. The heated air sweeps up water vapor, molecules of water that float in the air. And tiny specks of the fuel, the material being burned, into a dark cloud of smoke. The more incompletely something burns, the more smoke it produces. Because more particles are left to be swept up into the air. Smoke gradually spreads out and drifts away, with gravity pulling the heaviest bits back to the ground. When a fire first starts to burn, there is usually a lot of smoke. Which decreases as more of the fuel is burned completely. Smoke detectors take advantage of the fact that fires cause a lot of smoke in their early stages. The detectors sense the small particles in smoke before a fire really starts to burn. An optical smoke detector uses a light beam and light sensor that sounds an alarm when smoke particles get in the way of the beam. An ionizing smoke detector can sense even smaller particles. They disturb a low electric current inside which sets off an alarm. What is blood? Blood acts as your body's transportation system. Pumped along by your heart, Blood brings oxygen from the air you breathe and nutrients from the food you eat to all the cells of your body. It also keeps cells clean and healthy by taking waste products away after. The nutrients and oxygen have been used for processes like growth and repair. In addition, blood transports hormones chemicals made in glands that control a variety of processes throughout your body. Blood also carries heat throughout your body. More than half of your blood is a watery liquid called plasma. Plasma contains things like nutrients and waste products. Along with chemicals and matter needed for clotting, or sealing a wound before too much blood escapes. 
the rest of blood is made of tiny cells. Most are red blood cells, which distribute oxygen throughout your body and carry away the waste gas carbon dioxide, which is released from your lungs. The remaining cells are white blood cells, which protect you from infections by attacking and destroying disease-causing germs that enter your body. Red blood cells are the smallest cells in your body. But what they lack in size they make up for in number. In a drop of blood the size of the head of a pin there are 5 million red blood cells. In that same drop are 10,000 white blood cells and 250,000 platelets. Small ovals of matter that gather wherever a blood vessel is injured to plug the hole and help form a clot. Is there life in outer space? Despite many reports, over many years, of people seeing alien spacecraft, unidentified flying objects, or UFOs, and of personal encounters with creatures from outer space. There has not yet been any real scientific evidence to indicate that life exists anywhere else in the universe but on planet Earth. The other planets in our solar system cannot support life as we no, if they are too hot or too cold, and they have no water sources. Still, because the universe is so unimaginably vast, the possibility of life existing on a planet elsewhere in the Milky Way or in another galaxy cannot be ruled out for certain. Since 1960 scientists have been involved in a program called SETI. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The scientists who take part in this program look for radio signals. Emitted in outer space that could indicate the existence of some form of life. Assuming these other life forms would have developed radio technology. Radio waves can travel farther than visible light. So such signals could come from places in the universe too far away to be seen with ordinary telescopes. Radio waves are also not blocked or distorted by our atmosphere. In recent years scientists have begun looking for pulses of laser light in addition to radio waves. Why doesn't it hurt when I have my hair or nails cut? The hair that shows above your skin is composed of dead cells made up of a tough protein called keratin. Toenails and fingernails are also made of keratin. So hair and nails have no feeling above the surface of your skin. They are alive below the skin, though, where their roots are attached to nerves. That is why it hurts when someone pulls your hair, they are tugging at live roots. But having your hair and nails cut doesn't hurt at all. Why are there two scales for measuring temperature? Temperature is the amount of heat in a gas, liquid, or solid. Heat results from the kinetic energy, or rate of movement, of the molecules in objects or matter. 
If the molecules move slowly, the temperature is lower, and if they move quickly, the temperature is higher. Any number of different scales can be used to measure heat, all that is needed to create a scale are two reference temperatures and degrees that mark off intervals in the range of temperatures between them. In the two temperature measurement systems used most often Celsius, also called centigrade. And Fahrenheit the two reference points are the boiling and freezing temperatures of water. Celsius is based on the metric system, so 100 intervals or degrees separate these two points. Water freezes at 0 degrees Celsius and boils at 100 degrees Celsius. The Fahrenheit scale widely used in English-speaking countries until recently and still used in the United States today. Has 180 units or degrees that separate the freezing and boiling points of water. With 32 degrees Fahrenheit being the freezing point and 212 degrees Fahrenheit being the boiling point. Other temperature measurement scales include the Kelvin scale which is used in astronomy and other sciences. One of its reference points is absolute zero, which in theory is the lowest possible temperature. The point at which molecules have no kinetic energy or heat. The Celsius, Fahrenheit, and Kelvin scales all got their names from the men who invented them. Mathematical equations can be used to convert temperature measurements from one scale to another. To convert Fahrenheit to Celsius, subtract 32 from the temperature and then divide by 1.8. To convert Celsius to Fahrenheit, multiply the temperature by 1.8 and then add 32. To convert Celsius to Kelvin, Simply add 273.15 to the Celsius temperature. What is a fossil? A fossil is the hardened remains or an imprint of a plant or animal that lived a very long time ago. Some fossils are thousands of years old, others are several hundred million years old. Most plants and animals died and then decayed without ever leaving a trace. But some were buried under mud, rocks, ice, or other heavy coverings before decaying. The pressure of these layers over thousands of years turned animal and plant remains into rock. Usually fossils preserve the organism's hard parts the bones or shells of an animal and the seeds, stems, and leaf veins of plants. Sometimes the fossil is the actual animal part, like a bone or tooth, that has hardened into rock. Some fossils, called trace fossils, show the imprint of parts of the animal or plant. Occasionally these imprints act as a mold. And the sediment that fills the imprint hardens and becomes a cast of, for example, a dinosaur footprint. Sometimes bones or trees are preserved by minerals that seep into the part's pores and then harden, or petrify, that part. Arizona's petrified forest contains numerous examples of giant trees that were petrified millions of years ago. In some cases, an entire animal is preserved in ice. Hardened tree sap, called amber, or in dry, desert areas. In these instances, 
as with woolly mammoths found in Alaska and elsewhere, the whole animal hair. Skin, bones, internal organs is preserved much as it was when it died thousands of years earlier. Do zoo animals hibernate? Animals that hibernate in the wild do so because temperatures drop and food supplies become scarce. In the zoo, however, animals live in a controlled environment. They are given a constant supply of food and warm pens or buildings to retreat to when it gets chilly outside. Some animals, including bears, may get sluggish during the coldest months at the zoo. But they will not spend months at a time sleeping as they might do in the wild. Why do cats have whiskers? The whiskers of a cat are part of its sense of touch. The long stiff hairs are called vibrissae, and, just like our own hairs, they are connected to nerves at their roots that send information to the brain. A house cat usually has 12 whiskers on either side of its nose, as well as a few above its eyes, on its cheeks, and behind its front legs. These long, sensitive whiskers are particularly useful at night, when many cats are most active. They can give a cat information about surroundings that it can barely see. Whiskers can help a cat feel the distance between objects, letting it know if it can pass between them. Some scientists think that cat whiskers are so sensitive that they can feel the air move around objects. Keeping a cat from bumping into them or helping it to travel safely over uneven ground. Where do rivers come from? Some rivers start as underground streams, making their way to Earth's surface from layers of rock beneath the ground. Others get their water supply from melting glaciers, ice masses located on land. But most get their start from rain or snow that falls in high, steep country. That water then runs down in little streams that join together, making bigger streams and eventually rivers. And some rivers may join together to form even greater rivers. Over time, the flowing water of a river cuts a path into the rock over which it passes, creating a valley. Most rivers flow downhill, making their way from their high country source to lower, flatter land, where they broaden, curve, and move more slowly. Eventually rivers join the ocean. There, at the place where a river enters the ocean called the mouth of the river it may deposit much of the sediment or dirt that it has been carrying, creating an area of rich land and many water channels known as a delta. Rivers have played an important role in human history. They allowed people to settle inland, away from the oceans and other large bodies of water. Before people built roads, they used rivers to travel from one place to another. 
towns, cities, and even great civilizations grew up around rivers. Which provided the water necessary for raising livestock, farming, and other advanced human activities. Why does poison ivy give people rashes? A very irritating oily substance called urushiol is in all parts of a poison ivy plant. As well as in its itchy cousins, poison oak, and poison shumac. The plants are found across North America, especially near streams and lakes. The oil itself is harmless, but once it interacts with substances on human skin, it can be interpreted by the body as an unwanted foreign invader. The body's immune system then kicks in and tries to get rid of it. This response is an allergic reaction. About 70% of all people are allergic to the plants and will develop itchy red bumps, blisters, and skin swelling a short time after they come in contact with them. Once the rash occurs, it can spread from one part of the body to another and sometimes lasts many days. Contact with these poisonous plants can happen directly, when a person touches them. Or indirectly, when he or she touches clothes, tools, or animals that have the irritating oil on them. Very sensitive people can even get a rash from the smoke of burning poison ivy, oak, and shumac. The best way to keep from getting an itchy rash is to avoid the plants that cause them. Avoidance is especially hard with poison ivy, which is a creeping. Crawling vine that lives among other plants, poison oak and shumac are more bush-like. Learning what poison ivy looks like helps, the vine has smooth leaflets arranged in clusters of three. Which are red in early spring, change to shiny green in summer, and then back to red in autumn. Poison ivy sometimes has grey berries, too. If you know that you will be visiting a place where poison ivy grows. Wear pants and long sleeves and even gloves. Afterwards, your outfit should be washed as soon as possible separate from other clothes with hot water and strong soap. If you accidentally touch a poison ivy plant, wash your skin with soap and water right away and then use rubbing alcohol to make sure that all of its irritating oil is gone. If you get a rash anyway, try not to scratch, which will only make it worse. Most people get relief from such rashes with anti-itch medications like hydrocortisone, which reduces the swelling and keeps your body from reacting to the plant's oils. See a doctor if the rash covers your face or a large area on your body. What is dust? Dust is made up of particles of all sorts of things. In places where people live, a great deal of dust comes from flakes of dead skin, which are being shed all the time. Dust mites, tiny microscopic creatures that feed on this dead skin, make up dust, too, including their waste and tiny skeletons. Particles of the environment contribute to dust as well grit from the sidewalk. 
salt from the sea, dry earth, pollen from plants, smoke from burning materials. And earth gets 10 tons of dust from outer space every day. From the millions of meteors that burn up as they enter our atmosphere. How does a fire extinguisher work? In order for something to burn, high heat and oxygen are needed. All fuels have their own particular temperatures at which they begin to burn when exposed to high heat, called their flashpoints. Removing heat or oxygen from fuel will put out a fire. Water is frequently used to extinguish fires. Large supplies of water can be found almost anywhere. An important condition when dealing with large fires, like those in burning buildings. Water works in two ways to put out a fire. First, it sharply reduces the temperature of the burning material. Second, it covers the material, keeping oxygen-filled air from reaching the material. But water can't put out oil fires, because oil floats on the surface of water. An oil fire's oxygen supply can't be cut off by water. Other substances liquids, gases, or powders that don't burn must be used to smother the fire and remove its oxygen supply. Most fire extinguishers are filled with carbon dioxide, a heavy gas that prevents burning. When released, the gas forms a type of snowy foam that both covers and cools a fire. Powdered sodium bicarbonate, what we know as baking soda, is also used in extinguishers, usually for use on oily chemical fires. It quickly melts in heat, forming a crust that keeps oxygen out. If you don't have a fire extinguisher on hand you should always throw baking soda on a cooking fire that involves grease. Water will only spread the fire by causing splattering. Because the substance in a fire extinguisher must cover a large area very quickly. It needs to be released in a powerful spray. The extinguishing substance is stored inside the tank under high pressure. Which drives it out of a nozzle with great force once it is released. Why shouldn't I lie? Because people live together and depend on each other for their care and safety. It is important that they tell the truth to one another. Lying can cause bad things to happen, and a famous story dramatically illustrates this idea. The story describes a boy who lived in a village that was sometimes threatened by wolves. One day he thought he saw such a beast and cried, Wolf! Wolf! The villagers ran to the boy's house with pitchforks and other weapons to protect him from the wild animal. But the boy was mistaken there was no wolf and the villagers were glad that he was safe. The people returned to their homes. The boy liked the attention that his cries had brought, however, and thought that he would give the alarm again. He cried wolf, a second time, and again the villagers came running. 
Again they were glad that the boy was safe. But they told him that he should be more certain the next time before calling them. The boy cried wolf. A third time and the villagers still came, but not as fast as before. By the time he had called a fourth and fifth time, the people of the village knew that the boy was a liar. They no longer answered his calls, which turned out to be a very bad thing. When the wild beast finally did come one night, the villagers assumed the alarm was false and did not come to rescue the boy who cried wolf. Lying breaks the basic rule of conduct that helps people get along in the world. Treating others in the same way in which you would like to be treated. When you lie, it shows that you care more about yourself and about what the false information can do for you than about other people, who may face problems because of it. Imagine what your life would be like if people frequently lied to you. You would make all sorts of mistakes and be in a constant state of confusion. Not knowing what was true and what was false. The world would be a crazy place if people couldn't trust one another to tell the truth. It is especially tempting to lie when telling the truth will get you into trouble. But remember this, lies are usually discovered which only makes matters worse. All P-E-O-P-L-E make mistakes, but lying about what you've done makes the situation far worse. It shows that you can't be trusted. People who are truthful about their mistakes are admired because it takes courage and a great deal of maturity to admit when you're wrong. You will find that when you own up to your misdeeds, your parents or teachers will appreciate your honesty and be much more forgiving than if you had lied about it and later been found out. People appreciate others who are honest because they know those people can be counted on. Why don't girls have penises? In both males and females, urine exits the body through a tube called the urethra. In males, the urethra is located in the penis. A male's urethra is also the pathway through which a fluid called semen passes. Made in the male reproductive organs in the lower abdomen and scrotum, the skin sac attached to the lower abdomen behind the penis. Semen contains the sperm cells that fertilize female egg cells to create babies. Females don't have penises because they don't need them. Their shorter urethra passes through the lower abdomen, expelling urine. Female reproductive organs are all located on the inside of the body, where a baby can safely develop. During sexual intercourse, a man inserts his penis into a woman's vagina. The passageway that leads to the uterus, the structure in which babies grow. Once semen is released, a sperm cell may fertilize the single egg cell that a Woman releases each month from one of two ovaries, which are connected to the uterus. If that occurs, a baby eventually develops. Will the sun ever burn out?
it is believed that the sun like all stars will burn out eventually. As a star uses up the hydrogen that fuels the nuclear reactions that power it. It is thought to die, collapsing in upon itself. But it's unlikely this will happen in the near future. Our sun is expected to shine for at least another 5 billion years. What causes goosebumps? Goosebumps or goose pimples are little bumps on your skin that appear when you are cold or afraid. They are named that because they look like the bumpy flesh of a goose that's had its feathers plucked. When you are cold the muscles in your skin raise the hairs on your body so that they can trap a thicker layer of air next to your skin, which may keep you a bit warmer. And, as with all muscular activity, this contraction of the skin muscles also produces heat. When you are afraid, the same process occurs, but for a different reason. At such times your body produces a chemical called adrenaline, which prepares you for emergency action. It makes your heart beat faster and your muscles tense, and that raises your hair. In animals with fur, raised hair makes them look bigger and may scare predators away. Scientists think that long ago, when people were covered with coats of heavy hair, Goosebumps help protect them in the same way from their predators. How can blind people read books? Many blind people read specially printed books using the Braille system. Developed by a French boy named Louis Braille in 1824. Braille, who became blind when he was three years old. Was only 15 when he modified a code used by the military for reading in the dark. Braille's new system involved raised dots that stood for letters, numbers, punctuation symbols, and words. There are 63 characters in the Braille code each one a unique combination of one to six raised dots. Once blind people have learned the Braille alphabet, they can read Braille books by lightly touching the book's pages with their fingers. Some people who become blind later in life, after having learned to read, prefer to use a system that incorporates the alphabet they are familiar with rather than learning Braille. A device called the Optacon can be used with regular books, it enlarges and raises each letter, which the blind person can then feel with her fingers and read. Another way for blind people to discover the content of a book is through talking books which are recordings of entire books novels, school books. And so on that can be played back on cassette or compact disc players. Optical scanners are another way to translate printed materials into sounds these computers. Scan a page from a book or magazine, and a computer-generated voice reads the material aloud. How does money circulate? After new money is printed at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. 
the United States Treasury Department ships it to the 12 Federal Reserve Banks that are spread throughout the country. The Reserve Banks then distribute the cash to commercial banks and other institutions where people keep their money. Customers withdraw cash from banks and spend it on gas, food, books, and so on. Eventually the stores deposit the bills back at the bank, and the process begins again. What happens when people stutter? People who stutter speak with many uncontrolled pauses and repetitions of sounds. It is caused when some of the muscles involved in speech spasm, or contract abnormally. Talking is a complicated process that involves muscles that work the lungs. Vocal cords, throat, tongue, cheeks, and lips. When each part doesn't work precisely together, stuttering can occur. Stuttering is not uncommon in young children. They are still learning about language and searching for new words and new ways of putting them together. In speech. But well before a child is ready to enter school, help for stuttering should be found. Children who cannot communicate well with others become frustrated. And start to feel bad about themselves and their abilities. Doctors don't really know why people stutter. Though it seems to run in families and affects far more boys than girls. It is believed that a problem in the motor control center of the brain. Along with nervous tension, causes the muscles of speech to spasm. Training to speak slowly and smoothly and to breathe deeply during talking often helps the problem. What is an allowance? An allowance is an amount of money usually given each week to a child by his or her parents. Kids can use this money to pay for their personal expenses. For things like special snacks, toys, or activities with their friends. In some families, parents do not give their kids allowances. And children just ask their parents when money is needed. But allowances are useful, because they help teach kids how to manage money. Children learn how to control their expenses by staying within their weekly budgets. And children can learn to save if they want to buy something. Expensive by holding on to a portion of their allowances each week. Generally, as children grow older, they become better at handling money, they also have more expenses. So older children usually require larger allowances. In some families, allowances are considered payment for doing household chores. And they increase when children grow older and do more work around the house.